Hello, I'm Katie McDonald, a clinical dietitian with the CF Clinic at Primary Children's Hospital, Salt Lake City, Utah, USA. I served as the chair for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Systematic Review of the Literature regarding nutrition and cystic fibrosis. Thank you to the organizers of this symposium for the opportunity to present the impact of highly effective modulators, HEMT, on nutrition, weight, and digestive health. I'm grateful for the modulators and the transformational changes in the lives and health of individuals with cystic fibrosis. I'm excited to see what the future holds. I'm also humbled by the challenges that lie ahead in adapting CF nutrition practice to truly promote healthy living in the era of CFTR modulators. I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. My goals are to advocate for individualized, balanced, and healthy nutrition for people with CF throughout the life cycle and for the role of the registered dietitian nutritionist in delivering appropriate medical nutrition therapy as part of a multidisciplinary care team partnering with people with CF to achieve personal nutrition goals. As we know, Cystic fibrosis is a multi-system genetic disease associated with a high risk of malnutrition. Improved CF outcomes are associated with increased weight, height, and body mass index. Current dietary and nutrition status recommendations include the provision of 35 to 40% of calories from fat, um, an energy intake of 110 to 200% of same age non-CF individuals and minimum weight and BMI targets for age. These guidelines need reconsideration for people with CF receiving HEMT. Dietary quality for people with CF is also being scrutinized. Cross-sectional dietary consumption studies from Australia and the EU found high levels of energy dense nutrient-poor food consumed by children and adolescents with CF. High sugar, high fat, and low fiber intakes were described along with suboptimal nutrient profiles. In adults, poor quality diets with high levels of added sugars were associated with increased visceral fat and elevated fasting glucose concentrations. Through the lens of the potential good health and longevity offered by HEMT, improving dietary quality for all persons with CF is urgent. However, specific evidence-based guidance for CF dietary intake patterns remains scant, especially for those with HEMT. There is little potential for placebo-controlled randomized trials in CF nutrition. Our challenge in determining best practice for optimizing nutrition in people with CF going forward um, and a consensus is needed among uh, CF and nutrition experts to drive practice for optimizing nutrition in CF to improve care. A systematic review of the literature um, that was mentioned earlier had three articles that are not now available in print. Modulators and anthropometric parameters, macronutrients, and dietary guidelines. I will very briefly touch on each of these articles. Although mixed weight gain results were found with Ivacaftor and the dual combination therapies, ETI more consistently results in improved weight gain and BMI. The AND review determined no evidence exists to recommend a higher than normal fat intake for people with CF, except in the context of achieving higher energy intakes in a lesser volume of food. Although dietary fat is required for optimal absorption of HEMT, no evidence is available to suggest that the amount of fat needed for HEMT 
uh, dosing exceeds the amount of fat in a standard balanced meal. If you do the math for the standard 2000 calorie per day diet with three meals, two snacks, and a 30% fat distribution, each meal would theoretically contain about 17 grams of fat. The general philosophy of the AND dietary recommendation is to use population norms such as national dietary guidelines in the absence of evidence for CF-specific dietary intake patterns. Again, using standard healthy meals and snacks should be adequate for dosing HEMT and attaining or maintaining healthy weight and body composition. So why is it important to focus on weight management for individuals who receive HEMT? Because IVACAFTER has been around for a longer period of time, more information is available about body composition and changes in dietary impacts. Our Australian um, colleagues King et al. demonstrated small weight gains and increases in fat-free mass in the first month after starting IVACAFTER. Significant increases in weight and fat mass continued for six months and then plateaued by about two and a half years. These researchers recommended body composition determinations in clinical settings to enable practitioners to make informed decisions about recommending weight gain or loss. The dietary impact of IVACAFTER helps explain the weight gain commonly seen with this HEMT. A pre-post comparison in adults with gating mutations after three months on IVACAFTER showed a reduction in resting energy expenditure, an increase in fecal elastase, but only for pancreatic sufficient individuals, a decrease in intestinal inflammation measured by calprotectin, a slight increase in the coefficient of fat absorption, an increased intake, and increased fat. Adding the number of calories from the decrease in um, REE, so 94, and the increased caloric intake, 210, gives 304 calories that could theoretically result in a one kilogram weight gain every 25 days. Not surprisingly, the BMI scores were found to increase significantly. To a point, weight gain for undernourished people with CF can be beneficial, but excessive fat mass gain may be problematic both psychologically and physiologically. The authors recommended that clinicians should pay careful attention to the effect of IVACAFTER on dietary intake, fat intake, and weight gain. I would add that clinicians need more guidance on the exact amount of healthy fat needed with HEMT dosing and strategies for people with CF to take adequate but not excessive dietary fat to optimize medication effects without unwanted and unneeded fat mass gain. In terms of management for people with CF who are overweight or obese, the Australian and New Zealand nutrition guidelines recommend regular monitoring with CF clinic visits and monitoring for weight-related comorbidities, especially in adults greater than 30 years. As evidence is unavailable, for treatment of overweight or obesity in people with CF, general population weight management guidelines are recommended for children, adolescents, and adults with CF. It is important to note assessment of nutritional status, anthropometry, and dietary intake in CF clinics should occur for those who are overweight or obese, as happens for those who are at nutritional risk for um, or underweight. 
any discussion of obesity in people with CF needs to include attention to food security. The CFF Food Security Committee recommends screening at each routine CF clinic visit with a two-item food security vital sign survey to assist people with CF with eligibility information, enrollment, and maintenance of available food-related resources. Additional information is available at foodinsecurity at cff.org and through Compass. Turning attention to salt for people with CF, the CF Foundation states, no one is sure how much salt people with CF uh, need. The usual recommendation is to eat salty foods and use the salt shaker freely at meals and snacks. No updated sodium guidance exists for people with CF receiving HEMT, although theoretically, sodium needs should be relatively like those for the general population. The FDA estimates that the average American adult eats 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day, and the recommended being less than 2,300. As we consider sodium recommendations for people with CF receiving HEMT, the average American intake may be a place to start. Additionally, sweat chloride values could help inform decisions regarding individual sodium needs. The implications of excessive salt intake for CF are unknown, but hypertension, stroke, and calcium loss are well described in the general public. Restoration of pancreatic function on HEMT is definitely a hot topic. Before HEMT, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency was considered irreversible, but is it more dynamic? Numerous case studies exist of young children, infants, and pancreatic function restoration on Ivacaftor. Progressive improvement um, has been noted in pancreatic function over time while on this medication. Anecdotal reports of numerous people with CF of all ages decreasing or stopping PERT after initiation of ETI exist, but no large studies are available. Closer monitoring of fecal elastase, IRT, amylase and lipase may adjust, may aid in adjusting PERT and individualizing care. In general, GI symptoms, including GERD, constipation, and pancreatitis seem to improve for people with CF on HEMT. However, constipation was noted as a serious adverse event in some HEMT clinical trials. As was determined prior to the availability of HEMT, constipation is not best treated by a reduction or discontinuation of PERT in pancreatic insufficient individuals. Fluid management and a minimum of a standard dietary fiber intake should be considered. Regarding enteral feedings, and, and HEMT, multiple reports of enteral use being um, decreased or discontinued, um, as well as oral supplementation while on MPI, on ETI. One study reports a 50% reduction in the requirement for enteral feeding, feedings in people with CF and severe lung disease. It's important to note that some people continue to require enteral or oral supplements and setting realistic goals and expectations is integral to maintaining adequate nutrition status. Monitoring oral and enteral intake, weight, and nutrition status is essential to facilitate a healthy transition between feeding modes. To sum up dietary recommendations for HEMT, it really depends on the genetic mutation and the HEMT used. Weight gain and the ability to weight gain normalizes in some individuals. 
proactive and ongoing nutrition guidance starting in childhood may be beneficial. In theory, there it may be a decreased salt requirement. Sweat chloride measurements while on HEMT could provide guidance. Decreased GI symptoms and less malabsorption. Restoration or improvement of pancreatic function, whether real or perceived in some people with CF. Fecal elastase measurements may be indicated. Alteration in vitamin plasma concentrations have also been described with increases in vitamin A and decreases in serum vitamin E. Careful monitoring is suggested to avoid deficiencies or toxicities. Adjustments in vitamin supplementation may be required. Continued standard nutrition screening and assessment protocols should be followed in CF clinic. So this is my wish list for specific recommendations for me medical nutrition therapy for people with CF, whether they are receiving HEMT or not. And that um, would include standardized protocols for screening at each regular CF clinical encounter, including nutrition status and food security, to incorporate routine measurement of body composition not just weight and BMI, minimum annual full nutrition assessments with serum vitamin levels. People with CF would monitor weight changes at least monthly between clinical encounters and collaboration to exist between people with CF and healthcare professionals to determine individualized nutrition goals and strategies. And last but not least, a focus on healthy, balanced dietary intake and diet quality, personalized for preferences and specific needs for the individual with CF. In summary, CF is changing at a cellular level with breakthroughs in CFTR modulator therapy. There will likely be change in recommended energy needs to be more like a general population. More data are needed for guidance on required fat intake and type for optimal HEMT absorption. Less salt will be, absor will be prescribed and more individualization of micronutrient prescriptions. Medical therapy for individuals with CF of all ages needs to evolve rapidly and to provide novel individualized approaches throughout the life cycle while considering long-term implications of therapeutic interventions. Significant opportunity exists for improving nutrition recommendations, including international collaboration to determine best practice. And finally, remember that good nutrition is preventive medicine. I thank you very much for your attention and I have references listed. Hello, I'm Cynthia Brown, Adult CF Director at Indiana University. I would like to thank the organizers of this session for allowing me to speak about pulmonary health in the era of highly effective modulator therapies. For those of us who are in clinical care, our patients and caregivers, we certainly are experiencing a whole new world uh, with a lot of opportunities to look forward to since the approval of ETI. And here are my disclosures. In the past year, I have served as site PI for studies uh, for, from Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Translate Bio. I do receive grant funding from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and I serve on the CF Foundation's Clinical Research Advisory Board, as well as the TDN Steering Committee. Over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I want to present to you a variety of uh, information that would include uh, an overview of what we know about the pulmonary effects of highly effective modulator therapy two years after the approval of ETI or Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor. Because of these amazing effects, this has opened the door for opportunities to consider reducing treatment burden cystic fibrosis through clinical research However, we all know that many of our patients are choosing to do this independently 
And we want to talk about how to open those doors and consider how we uh, keep those lines of communication open in clinical practice. In 2011, the first highly effective modulator therapy, Ivacaftor, was uh, introduced with this seminal publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was approved for use by the FDA the next year. While we saw tremendous gains from Ivacaftor, we knew we weren't done because only 5% of our patients could benefit from Ivacaftor. Two years ago in 2019, at our last in-person meeting, we celebrated along with Dr. Francis Collins the uh, publications of Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor for individuals with one or two copies of the F508 allele, seeing really tremendous gains in lung function and decreases in exacerbations in those clinical trials. Now, two years later, we are continuing to see additional information come out. The open label extension study uh, that showed the benefits over 48 weeks was published earlier this year. Uh, you can see that individuals continue to experience a sustained increase in lung function over the entire course of the trial. And nutritional outcomes continue to also improve. So we are seeing individuals be able to maintain and sustain their overall health. We also are able to celebrate the expansion of the FDA approval for patients with some rare, rare mutation in December of last year. This allowed modulators to become available for about 600 individuals who had no previous modulator. And this summer, the FDA expanded the approval of ETI down to children between the ages of six and 11, further expanding the population that can qualify for ETI. We are seeing a rapid uptake in highly effective modulator use. The last CF patient registry report available to me as I put these slides together was from 2019. However, you can see in 2019, by the end of the year, almost 6,000 individuals had been on Trikafta. And this is really especially important because there was only two months at the end of 2019 that we had the opportunity to get people on the ETI. In our own registry report, you can see this really sharp uptake in uh, modulator use oh, between 2019 and into 2020, uh, such that 93% of individuals at Indiana University are currently receiving a CFTR modulator. What this means on the real world effects on lung function and exacerbations has been dramatic. You can see between 2019 and 2020, a sharp increase in lung function, both at Indiana University and across the network. You also can see this really remarkable decline in exacerbation frequency. Over the decade prior to the approval of ETI, exacerbations were fairly steady with 40 to 50% of individuals experiencing one or more exacerbations in any given year. In 2020, this dropped to less than 20%, both at Indiana University and across the network. While I am sure there's a pandemic effect here because we had fewer uh, PFTs to evaluate, we also believe that patients were reporting fewer symptoms due to masking and social distancing. However, it'll be interesting to see if in 2021 and beyond, we continue to see this effect. This is, as stated, this has opened the door for us to begin to talk about decreasing treatment burden. For years, all we've done is add more and more therapies to our patients. And our patients are excited and they want to be able to regain their life and their time. In 2017, more than 130 individuals who are members of Community Voice stated that reducing treatment burden was their second highest priority research area. However, reduction of treatment burden has not been prioritized for research until highly effective modulator therapy. In 2018, you can see that reducing treatment burden was considered a priority for community members as well as clinicians, but that same year, the CF Foundation had funded no research studies looking at how, ways that we could decrease treatment burden. In the planning stages of Simplify, 
the investigators asked individuals which treatments that they felt were most burdensome. We know from prior research that individuals with CF spend more than an hour every day with adults spending about 104 minutes every day doing their respiratory therapy and children spending 74 minutes. And the things that uh, the individuals responding to this community voice survey thought were the most burdensome were airway clearance and inhaled antibiotics with more than 90% of individuals stating that airway clearance and inhaled antibiotics were at least somewhat to very burdensome. Likewise, hypertonic saline and Dornase don't fare much better. While they weren't typically seen as very burdensome, about two thirds of individuals or higher felt that these were at least somewhat burdensome. So we ask patients to do a lot. When I'm teaching medical students and fellows, I often ask them to put themselves in the shoes of our cystic fibrosis patients so that they can understand the lived experiences of these individuals. When you ask patients how they feel about their therapies, it's a gamut. Um, generally, nebulizers come with a lot of side effects, making people feel tight, making them cough, making them feel nauseous, tired, causing chest pain. In, the pa in times past, individuals were willing to accept these burdens because it, it, they knew that doing the treatments would help them continue to feel stronger and healthier. In younger children, the parents carried a huge burden, feeling like they always had to force kids to be able to maintain their therapy. Um, a lot of nagging, a lot of guilt, um, and a lot of um, con a conflict within the family just to be able to maintain therapies. And as time goes on, particularly in this era of highly effective modulators, what if patients aren't feeling like they're getting benefits? How do you continue to make, maintain motivation if you're not noticing that you're going to feel better? And finally, patients felt like there has to be research in how we take some of this away. Individuals hate it when new meds come out because it just means more stuff, not less stuff. And this is where we are now. We have these options and opportunities and it's time to take them. In 2020, an abstract was presented using data collected from surveys of individuals at Indiana University, as well as clinicians across the CF Learning Network. And we asked patients and family members, as well as clinicians, how interested would you be in participating in a trial where we could withdraw a chronic daily therapy? Interestingly, patients tended to have uh, a more pessimistic view of these trials. Some of them didn't want to stop therapies at all, were not interested at all in, in withdrawing therapies such as inhaled antibiotics um, or enzyme therapy or airway clearance. Whereas clinicians, almost every therapy was on the table. They were at least somewhat interested in studying a variety of these therapies. So overall, clinicians were more enthusiastic in 2019, before the approval of Trikafta, about studying withdrawal than patients were. In the planning stages of Simplify, uh, the investigators also asked how many clinicians estimated their, their patients were stopping therapies. And you can see a fair number of clinicians felt like at least some percentage, a third or more of their patients were stopping their chronic daily therapy after starting a highly effective modulator. In addition, patients with CF or their caregivers, about one in five of them were saying, you know what? Yes, we have stopped our chronic daily therapies. So this has already been happening and people are interested in it. We can learn from IVACAFTER. I mentioned IVACAFTER is the first highly effective modulator therapy. Our colleagues in the UK uh, access the UK CF registry. And IVACAFTA was approved in the UK in 2012. Beginning in 2013, individuals who were IVA eligible saw a decrease in their inhaled antibiotic use, a decrease in their Dornase use, 
and a decrease in their hypertonic saline use over the ensuing five years, with a significant difference between individuals who are IVA ineligible versus IVA eligible. And one thing we learned from looking at this data was that individuals were more likely to withdraw the therapy if they had better lung function with an FEV1 over 60 or even over 80%. And the younger individuals also withdrew therapy uh, more often. Currently, we have the Simplify study that has ongoing enrollment across the United States. Uh, in the years since, enrollment has opened. Uh, it has been quite rapidly enrolling. I would refer you to the on-demand session, for, uh, which is an on-demand session 03.3. For more information about how enrollment is going in the Simplify study and an in-depth discussion of trial design. In this study, individuals who are on hypertonic saline or Dornase are randomized into one of two arms if Patients on hyper, they could have their hypertonic saline withdrawn for six weeks or their DNAs withdrawn for six weeks. And then, follow, then following that, individuals can return to their prior therapy or they may decide to stay off of it. And as stated, this information, this trial is ongoing. Enrollment is ongoing and it's occurring quite rapidly. The study is seeking to enroll over 900 individuals across the United States. I have the pleasure of co-leading the HERO2 observational study with Clement Wren. Um, we view this as a real world research study, trying to determine how treatments and um, symptoms, how treatments are being used and what the symptoms are among patients who are prescribed ETI therapy. This is truly an observational study. Data, all data will be collected through the Folia Health application. So individuals will report their daily symptoms, which treatments they use every day. We will, in the background, integrate this with the CF patient registry to determine the effects of patients withdrawing therapy on lung function and exacerbation. Over 200 individuals have enrolled in this study already as well. And I'm excited to also present the data uh, from our early look um, at the on-demand session 03.3 as well. Last year, I presented this abstract looking at some patients at Indiana University who had had a first follow-up after starting ETI therapy uh, in the first three months of 2020. So as you all know, beginning in March 2020, clinical care changed due to the pandemic. So I only wanted individuals who had visits before our clinical care changed. And at that time, I had seen 88 individuals it, for a return visit in person. And in that time frame, within two to three months of starting ETI, 38% had made a change to at least one of their chronic daily therapies. And 50% of those who had made change made more than one change. The changes in therapy, the people who are more likely to change therapy had a baseline improvement in FEV1 that was greater than individuals who did not. And it didn't matter where FEV1 started. FEV1 started in some individuals as low as about 30%, some individuals as high as 70 or 80%. And you can see here that the therapies that individuals were most likely to decrease or change were the ones that they, that were previously reported to be um, the most burdensome treatments. So you see that Six individuals stopped their airway clearance. 14 decreased their airway clearance. More than 10 stopped and inhaled antibiotics. Uh, and another three had decreased. Rather than doing continuous alternating therapy, they went to every other month alternating therapy. So airway clearance and inhaled antibiotics are, are the most burdensome and seem to be the therapies that people are most interested in stopping or decreasing. And some of our early look at our HERO2 data, um, which will be presented later, also confirms that this is what patients are doing at home. So when you see a patient and they tell you that they've changed their therapies, I think it's really important to use some of the tenets of good communication 
uh, that are espoused by the Partnership Enhancement Program. We want to know what people are doing. We want pe people to feel comfortable, engaged, and, and, and open with us in a non-judgmental way. So you have to first establish the trust with your patients and families. And I think as a community, we do this really well. We want to create an open dialogue, use open-ended questions, ask how are you, you know, how have your therapies changed since you started ETI? Maybe no. Wow, you've had a really great response. Has any has anything else changed because you seem to be doing so well? So make sure that you're um, using positives and uh, respecting the individual. And it, once you've done that and you've created that bubble. You've created that safe space to talk about what you are or may not be doing any longer. That, that allows you to create that partnership with your patient and do shared decision making so you can understand what the right thing to do going forward. And many of my patients who come to me and say, you know, I stopped my inhaled tobramycin because I didn't feel like I was getting a lot out of it. I say, well, that's great. But maybe you need to uh, you need to let us know if your symptoms change so that we can resume it. Or for individuals who stopped a mucolytic like Dornace, maybe it's important that you keep some of that in the refrigerator. So if you do get sick, you have some on hand so that you can increase your therapies quickly. So these are all ways that you can engage and open the door for additional conversation. So I'd like to conclude. And, and celebrate the benefits, the substantial benefits that we're seeing in terms of ongoing pulmonary health, decreased exacerbations and overall well-being. Many patients are already decreasing treatment burden. We know it's a priority for the community. We have a lot to learn about the outcomes with this. Uh, we have many ongoing studies, but I think it's important for us as providers to support our patients without judgment so that we know what's happening and that we can understand how and when we can decrease and when we may need to increase. So with that, I'll end and I thank you for your time and attention. Hello, thank you very much for this opportunity to be part of the symposium. My name is Sigrid Ladora, Associate Professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing. The title of my presentation is The Psychosocial Challenges Associated with Improvements of Physical Health, Unanticipated Implications of CFTR Modulator Therapy. Here are my disclosures. I have received the following funding for this presentation from the NIH, specifically NICHD, the UAB School of Nursing Dean Scholars Award, and the UAB Faculty Development Grant. I have three main objectives today. The first is to summarize the history and effects of different CFDR modulator therapies, and then describe the psychosocial challenges experienced by those who are on modulators. And finally, to examine opportunities for future research related to addressing these psychosocial challenges. So again, very briefly, here's the timeline for when we received FDA approval for these modulators. Starting in 2012 with Iva Kafter, also known as Kaleidico as the brand name. Then we saw Lumicafter, Ivacafter, also known as Orcambi as the brand name. 2018, we saw Tezacafter and Ivacafter be approved, also known as Simdeco as a brand name. And then finally, two years as Kafter, Tezacafter, Ivacafter, triple combination, also known as Trikafta as the brand name here in the United States. It is without a doubt that we saw incredibly positive effects of these modulators. So we saw improvement in BMI, lung function, quality of exercise ability, pancreatic function, to list a few. We also saw reduced incidence of pathogens, improvement in sweat chloride levels, reducing uh, hospitalization rates and pulmonary exacerbations, as well as a slowing down of lung function deterioration over time. Another one of the um, most uh, significant um, effects of specifically Trikafta is this phenomenon called the Trikafta baby boom, where you see here um, a share of photo and a story 
um, with permission from the author, where she posted um, her Trikafta baby boom story. Um, here she is, she wrote that Cam, the baby here she's holding, is her Trikafta baby. Um, she reported that one month after taking Trikafta and boom, she got pregnant. So she's very thankful for modern medicine, for science, to be able to be a healthy mom to young daughters. So I'll be sharing with you um, a combination of different um, uh, findings from these three research studies primarily, as well as case reports and anecdotal evidence uh, that I've gathered from different CFs and other gray literature. So my primary research studies uh, that involve um, in this presentation um, are fertility preservation in women with CF, pre-lung transplantation that was supported by the NIH, and then the sexual and reproductive health in adult women with CF, and then an exploration of motherhood among women with CF. So is there a dark side to these modulators, despite all the good that it brought? And many would say yes. The first one that comes to mind um, that's uh, taken a lot of attention is uh, the increasing incidence in depression. So we already know that um, anxiety and depression are more common in the CF population compared to the general population. Um, and with these modulators, we're seeing more case reports uh, describing worsening anxiety and depression. For example, a writer uh, discussed or shared her story about um, after finally feeling like I had the right medications to manage my anxiety, she wrote, I started Trikafta and then everything changed. Struck with fatigue, all I wanted to do was stay in bed. Uh, Dr. Tyndall and colleagues also wrote a case report um, last year that talked about Trikafta and its psychopathology in uh, CF. Another theme that emerged uh, related to the use of CFTR modulators is this identity crisis. I wrote a case report on this as well, um, and uh, I talked about the lingering identity of being chronically ill and how that identity is being wiped away um, by using CFTR modulators. This was published um, in the Journal of Patient Experience. So I'll be highlighting some of the uh, words they were our participants. I also bolded um, some of these uh, key sections so that you can um, clearly see what's, what's important from these uh, verbatim quotes. So one of the participants um, shared related to um, the concept of identity crisis is um, she wrote, Trikafta has been working, but there's a part of me that I started to see parts of my CF not be so present symptom wise and whatnot. There's a part of me that's getting kind of freaked out because I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know who I am without CF. As silly as that may sound, yeah, I'd love for it to be taken away, this disease for me. But at the same time, it makes me panic a little because who am I going to be without CF? Another participant shared, there's so much that stuns you and that you identify with as a person. And your identity is now different with Trikafta. I identified as someone that coughed up green mucus a lot. To not have the expecting to go back, I keep thinking, this is going to wear off. When is it going to come back? So being afraid to lose all the gains that they've had with Trikafta. So there's a concern for the future amongst um, many who take these, um, these miracle drugs. So, um, one person shared um, that having been diagnosed with CF as a baby, I grew up thinking I had an early expiration date. Once I started Kaleidico, my health completely changed for the better. And for the first time, I had a solid future ahead of me and I needed to prepare for it. So some are ill-prepared for it and some are quite nervous about what is the future going to be like for them. JJ, another study participant, um, a pseudonym, um, shared, what does that mean for all those thoughts and feelings and plans I had for the future? It's very bizarre to be handed stability, a stability that, that they made for. Another theme is losing disability benefits and return to work. Um, one participant shared, I feel better. And somebody might say, well, you could go back to work. The insurance that I have because I'm disabled is paying for the medicine that's keeping me viable. So it's a cue for many of these individuals. 
in order to keep benefits I receive, I have an income limitation. Again, really playing within the confines of their disease and their disability benefits. Another theme that especially is being seen among was um, the weight gain related to taking these modulators. One participant said, after I started taking Orcambi, I gained probably 10 pounds or so. So my image of myself isn't what I'm used to being anymore and it's harder to adjust. I'm just not generally happy with what I see in the mirror. Another one said weight gain in pregnancy was concerning for a while. It gave me kind of a complex because um, about how I didn't look pregnant enough. So her concern was that she looked um, fat rather than pregnant um, in the eyes of the people around her and her as well. So there's a lot of body image issues and self-esteem issues that come with the weight gain. Certainly um, the modulators impact on family and fertility. Um, are recurrent issues. Uh, one participant said, well, how does this affect my fertility and birth control in all of this? Uh, unanswered questions that hopefully will soon be answered by the ongoing studies um, related to fertility and reproductive health that's uh, currently going on. Another participant said, that's what bothers me is that even with our Cambi and Simdeco, you're seeing similar situations of people becoming pregnant without, then again with Trikafta, meaning they're concerned about unexpected or unplanned pregnancies and um, how that affects their health. Amy, another pseudonym uh, shared, are there any sort of teratogenic effects from Trikafta? Again, lots of questions related to these modulators on fertility and reproductive health. Its effect on motherhood is also being questioned. Um, Sophia asks, what do I want to do as a mom? What do I want for my son on whether to stay on this modulator during breastfeeding? Can you keep breastfeeding while you're on Canby? Well, shared, her pediatric doctor does not want me going on it until we're completely weaned from breastfeeding. And finally, JJ um, shared Trikafta. There's not a ton of research on it. It does feel like a different experience compared to trying for our son. We are trying, I'm super excited, but also terrified. The fear of regression is also a theme. Um, regression to going back. Um, Sarah shared, I keep thinking this is gonna wear off. When is it gonna come back? I'm so nervous, I feel so good. I'm not used to living this way and I'm so afraid I'm gonna lose it. JJ shared, it's very back and forth because you're very hopeful and happy, but at the same time, you worry about going back to that original state of health that you were in. Any kind of little decline almost reminds you of that point. You have to remind yourself that you're doing better and it's overwhelming at first, for sure. Guilt is another theme that emerged, um, specifically survivor's guilt. Um, that's been talked about in the CF community. Uh, one wrote, the random and cruel nature of this disease means that someone can do everything exactly right and still become sicker. I've often wondered why when I've watched my friends continue to decline. And related to this is the guilt uh, when it comes to access to these life-saving medications and altering medications. There are many parts of the world that do not have access or cannot afford to take and buy these medications, um, unlike here for the most part. So where do we go from here? I've listed just a few implications to think about for research and practice. Um, so first is um, we need to do a better job with systematically assessing and documenting the psychosocial issues. As we start um, individuals on and definitely throughout um, the duration of when they're on modulators. We need to be routinely assessing and treating anxiety and depression, connecting them with licensed me mental health counselors, psychiatrists, or social worker, reporting adverse reactions to the maker of these drugs vertex, keep track of rates, um, encouraging patients to bring up any of these psychosocial issues uh, with their team and not feel ashamed or be silenced just because these drugs are supposed to be miracle drugs. It comes with negative side effects sometimes and we need to encourage our patients to talk about them. Um, we need to answer the questions related to birth control, pregnancy and fertility. 
And finally, how do we prepare today's youth with CF for a potentially long life that they didn't think about prior to this? That's the end of my presentation. Here are my references. I would like to acknowledge uh, um, nursing for supporting me in this work, the UAB CF Research Center, the CF Foundation, the NICHD, and certainly patients and families who participated in uh, my research studies across the years. If you have any questions and would like to connect with me, I've included my address on here, as well as a QR code that you could use to link right into my scholars UAB page, where you can find a few of my publications, my presentations, and again, my contact info, so you could reach out. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I hope to see you all um, at the next NACF. Thank you. That, so that photo there is actually a couple of months, a few weeks, months later. Um, I was still down at Duke, but um, that was the day that I was able to start taking Trikafta. Um, and this was the first modulator therapy that I was eligible for. And it was in September of 2019. Um, and I, so I didn't end up getting the transplant. I was still in the workup process and that's when I was able to access it. And you know, earlier the year in the year when I was so sick, I, I didn't think that I would make it long enough having my own native lungs to benefit. Um, but I am incredibly thankful. Next slide. And um, so Trikafta has brought me some gradual and, and moderate stability to my health. I was, like I said, I put transplant on pause. And, you know, during exercise, I still use supplemental oxygen. Um, I still get winded after a flight or two of stairs. I don't use as many antibiotics, which is very, very nice. Um, and I'm just very grateful for this advancement to be able to prolong my life without needing a transplant to, to whatever extent that will be. Uh, and I'm thankful for the tireless work of the foundation for having brought this into reality for us. Uh, and I'm very hopeful for, for what is to come for all of us. So the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is this is a drawing I created. Um, and I, I decided to draw this piece uh, as, a, as a tribute to those who have lost their battle with CF. Uh, and it's also for, for all of us that still fight. I think it, it resembles the abundant life within all of us. And I think it serves as a reminder, um, you know, not to take a moment for granted. Um, so it has like some writing at the bottom of it, but it's also on the left side. So I'll read that out loud. Um, and this is, I wrote this. Um, the branches are in the shape of lungs stemming from the main bronchi. The roses not only being symbols of CF are also symbols of flourishing life in lungs stricken with illness. And despite the dead and dying tissue of scarred lungs from infections, there is still beautiful life within each person that has CF. And our roses bloom with each battle we face and win to live to enjoy the next day and appreciate all that it has to offer. Hi, my name is Naomi, and I started Trikafta on 23rd of November, 2019, and today is the 31st of July, 2020. I've been asked to answer some questions and talk about my experience on Trikafta, and so I'd like to start off and just say that my life has changed tremendously since getting on Trikafta. Um, my energy level is higher. My exercise tolerance, I have of more of it. Um, I definitely am taking less medication. I am doing um, more in one single day than I've ever done since I was probably in high school. Um, my anxiety about the future has decreased. Um, I no longer am terrified of what I'm going to do if I can't keep working or I want to take care of some family members and not always be the one that needs the caretaking because I have the energy to do so now. And even if it's not perfect and I'm not completely cured, it is tenfold better quality of life. Um, I am not doing as many albuterol and saline treatments. 
I don't have to take antibiotics. I'm not doing a Toby pod inhaler. I haven't had IV antibiotics in at least eight, nine months. I did have a very bad virus back in February and I was able to recover without even taking any IV antibiotics, which before Trikapto was completely unheard of. Any kind of flu or cold virus would just help spin me into having to get IVs and recover that way. So that is huge. My exercise tolerance has gone up. I had actually given my bike to a friend because it was getting to the point where when I would try to ride up hills, it was just spinning me into a coughing attack and it was just not really fun anymore. So I just decided to walk and do other activities, but I actually was able to get my bike back. Um, and now I can ride up hills and I might have a little cough, but it's not so much that it's debilitating and I can't ride my bike anymore. So that's been really fun. I also, like I said earlier, have a little less anxiety about my future. And I'm confident that now if, you know, my partner loses his job or, you know, my mother gets sick, I can help out with that and hopefully continue to stay employed and be able to retire. And um, as far as my care team goes, I have been definitely very uplifted by them and just very touched by their investment in Trikafta and getting me the Trikafta. I know within the first few months that this drug was approved, I know my care team probably worked like 60 hour weeks just trying to get all of those approvals um, done and people getting the actual medication in a timely way. And I know that mine came pretty quickly after my insurance was approved and I kind of kept my care team posted about every little step of the way, you know, getting that initial approval and then letting them know when the drug arrived and letting them know how it felt and all my symptoms and then how amazing I felt and how I was running up and down the stairs because I had so much energy and could actually go up the stairs without going into a coughing fit again, unheard of before I track after. So all of those things have been just fantastic. And I feel like I've been able to sort of steal back some time, which is very, very nice. And um, yesterday, I went to the CF clinic and typically speaking, I have about a baseline of FEV1 48%. Um, and yesterday, after about eight months of being on Trikapta, I blew a 61%, which was fantastic. Um, and if I could just stay at 41% for the rest of my life, then I would be happy as a clam. And very thankful for everything that has uh, been accomplished. So thanks for listening. Well, thank you to each of our speakers for these insightful presentations, as well as our patient partners who provided some valuable perspectives on their changing paradigm of living with CF. I'm Stacy Bickle, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And my co-moderator behind the screen here fielding questions is Gail Yashar, licensed clinical social worker and mental health coordinator from Duke University Medical Center. I wanna mention we had one other speaker who was unable to present. So the objective related to the impact of HEMT on physical functioning and exercise is not addressed in today's session. However, this has given us plenty to think about and definitely speaks to the question of where do we begin or go from here? So we have quite a few questions coming in in the chat box. Um, so let's jump into them. Let's see. The first one um, that uh, even our last patient partner spoke to is the one of the fear of regression. Is this benefit going to go away. So I guess to um, Dr. Brown or Zigrid, is there enough evidence to suggest we can provide reasonable reassurance that the effect of ETI isn't going to go away over time? I think I'll start by um, answering that question and then um, Dr. Brown can chime in as well and add to it. Uh, thank you for that question. And I think this is a question that most people 
do think about those on ETI and other modulators. Um, they may not verbalize it with their CF care team, but um, probably in the back of their minds, they're thinking, wow, this seems like it's too good to be true. When is it going to stop working? And so uh, this was certainly brought up by several of um, the uh, patient participants who um, I was able to interview. Um, but essentially, we, we just don't know. We don't know the long term. Um, you know, su sustainability, but it looks really good and really promising at this point. It's yet another thing to study, of course. Um, Ivacaftor has a lot more data because it is the first one that's been approved and we have, um, you know, more information about it. But um, I'd say to those who may be thinking about um, pulling back or withdrawing their therapies, I would say first, uh, let your CF care team know about these fears of regression. Um, they've, they probably would benefit from hearing these, uh, these fears directly from their patients, and then they can address them. Um, also suggesting that um, uh, patients remain vigilant with their prescribed therapies and not to just take themselves off of uh, certain therapies just because they feel good. And so being vigilant and then having that conversation with their care team that I think Dr. Brown did a fantastic job in her presentation about making sure that you're consulting with a team and letting them know that you've been tracking your, your symptoms and how you're feeling and that perhaps you'd like to explore withdrawing you know, a certain uh, treatment or therapy. Um, you know, it's really important to have these open conversations with um, not just the CF physician, but uh, all the different team members who you think might be helpful and would be a good listening ear, and then to advocate on your behalf. So um, I think Dr. Brown can add to it if she can. Sure. I, I would um, reiterate what Sigrid has already said. Um, we don't obviously have long-term data yet uh, from Trikafta. However, the data that we do have about Ivacaftor shows certainly for many patients that there is a sustained decrease in need for antibiotics, um, a sustained improvement in lung function. While there may be some uh, declines over time, that initial bump in lung function um, stays up and then it changes the, the rate of decline over time. I think the other thing that we need to think about and can think about is that individuals that start on a medication earlier may have a different trajectory in their long-term um, outlooks. So when we're talking about now children who may start on trichafta by age of six, they may, and we certainly expect them to reach adulthood with relatively mild or almost no lung disease. So they may have a complete, it may be a completely different conversation with people who've been on longer term um, treatment with highly effective modulator therapy than uh, individuals who had fairly established lung disease. That being said, you know, we, we certainly hope that we're having an open door to allow patients to talk to us about their therapies. Um, I would say in most instances, by the time an individual has followed up in clinic with me, many times they've already independently said, well, you know, I didn't feel like I was bringing up as much with the hypertonic saline or Dornase as I used to. And since I wasn't feeling that benefit, I stopped it. And when you're seeing that patient and that individual is still 10, 15, 20% above their prior baseline, and they've told you they've stopped it, I have, as a provider, I have a hard time saying, well, you need to reintroduce this therapy. But what I can say is we don't know what the long-term implications of this might be. And, you know, we'll, we'll take it one office visit, one clinic visit at a time. But if we see changes or you feel changes, then you need to let us know so we can con consider um, reinstituting therapy. All right, there's a couple of questions coming in um, related to mental health symptoms. 
And I know, Zigrid, you addressed this in your presentation. Um, has there been any formal study looking at the impact on mental health um, from ETI, both depression, anxiety, and there's a question in the chat about foggy brain or forgetfulness or attention issues in children. Are you aware of any studies being done to look at that more formally yet? Yes, I think there are multiple studies looking at this because it is a big, um, it seems like a recurring uh, complaint. Um, and uh, certainly um, in, in participating in some of these uh, CF specific uh, social media groups, this is one of the most common um, things that come up about modulators. Uh, mental health seems to be really affected. And that's coupled with, um, I think someone mentioned guilt, I think in, in the chat there. Um, I, I don't know much about the parental side, the parental guilt that someone mentioned um, in the chat box, but I think that's a great question. You know, that transition of um, now that, you know, there's not so much of that intensive parenting involved because now the, the children are, are responding well to therapy. They're doing well in school. They're not in the hospital for long periods of time anymore. What happens to, to their intensive parenting? And that's been taken away. So I think that that's a great, uh, I think, question to ask. And now I'm having to take notes because that might be my next project uh, as a pediatric nurse practitioner. I'm interested in that as well. But I haven't looked at that personally. I don't know if Dr. Brown or Dr. McDonald uh, knows of uh, studies related to the, the foggy brain and the parental guilt. But I know for mental health, there are studies that are looking into that. Okay. Question for Dr. Brown. Um, what is your experience with sharing data such as chest CTs, lung function, organisms to discuss which therapies might um, be helpful to continue or discontinue? So uh, I start by using the CF SMART report, using a, a patient summary. I think, first of all, everybody likes pretty colorful graphs. And when you can see how your lung function changes on those graphs where you can show them lung function, weight over time, it's very helpful. Um, so I do use the SMART reports, particularly in those discussions. Um, in addition, I think that looking at past history of cultures, whether or not, you know, when was the last time you, an individual uh, may have grown pseudomonas. So those are the data that I typically will use when, I when, when having discussions with, uh, patients with CF and their families about changing and altering therapies. I, like I said, I think it can be really hard, you know, and, and this is something that in the back of my mind, I've had some interest in is, you know, if somebody, if I were to have a conversation with somebody that said, you know, maybe if you were to get two or 3% or 4% more lung function, like some studies have shown, would you be willing to give us, give up that 30 minutes of your day, you know, if they've stopped Dornase and hypertonic, what, what percent lung function extra at any given time would be worth it to that individual? And some individuals have that, but some individuals are like, look, my life, I like, I have a life now and I don't want to spend that 30 minutes anymore. I want to be freed up from from that, it, or I've stopped that vest, but I, you know what, I've replaced that vest with a 30 minute exercise class that I couldn't do before. And I can do that exercise class without coughing, you know, like to hear in when we were participating in some of the clinical trials of the highly effective modulator therapies, it, it, like other trials, uh, patients with CF would say, you can't, you, you, there's nothing I could do to convince them whether they got placebo or drug. Cause they would say, look, I went to my CrossFit class and every, people around me were asking, what am I doing differently? Cause I'm not coughing anymore. So I think when we're having those discussions, it's not just looking at a graph or looking at a culture. It's asking the patients about their values and what benefit they're getting, because I think there can be trade-offs in that situation where mm -hmm. we, we recognize the whole person and, and their 
the entirety of their experience with CF. Um, and, and I think that's where having a really good open line of communication with your care center is important to be able to figure out what part should be data driven. Um, and, and in this case, you're talking about an individual person's data, not big data across the network, but this person's data versus what's important to them in their uh, quality of life. Thank you. Okay, switching over to the nutrition side of this, Katie, um, how do we begin to approach BMI target goals and dietary recommendations for high fat, high protein, calorie dense diets in children under six who will be eligible for HEMT but are not yet? Do you have a different threshold for those children than you do for someone that maybe is not eligible for HEMT in a few years? Thank you. Um, that's an excellent question. And I would say that we still look at those BMI for percent for age target goals, um, you know, and really try to drill down to, you know, why are they not meeting those goals? Um, yes, we have seen, and especially among parents for children who are eligible for HEMT, you know, and we have suggested um, possibly more um, aggressive therapies such as um, G-tube placement. They say, no, no, we want to wait. And so I've seen more on the parent side, um, you know, of kind of a, a delay. Uh, I, I kind of worry, um, especially if we see stunting in a child and we just don't know what's going to happen you know, especially when those, uh, you know, either the children will become old enough or the uh, eligibility age will move down far enough. So, you know, we really try to individualize. And I think of, uh, you know, if I had one word to kind of um, describe what has been talked about in terms of nutrition therapy for this meeting, it's been individualized. We want to make sure that if the children are not meeting their target goals, why is that? Do they have oral aversion? Is there some sort of a GI complication that we need to address? And so, um, you know, it reminded me that uh, my mother would say, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and, and I think that's true. We, we do want to look at other possibilities. Yes, we have seen remarkable improvements for some people on HEMT, but I think there's a lot going on, especially in pediatric nutrition, and we can't just brush that under the rug and say, we'll just wait, and they'll be on um, some sort of a modulator therapy soon uh, or eventually, and then move forward with that. Um, I did want to go back, though. There was a question, you know, about regression um, and about parents losing a sense, of, you know, having a sense of loss of what, you know, was happening as their caregiver. And I think one of the, one of the most rewarding things for me um, through my career has been to establish long-term relationships with these families. And there have been a couple of times since um, we have had people start on modulators children where, you know, I've sat down with uh, the parents and a box of Kleenex and, you know, and they've cried and they've said, you know, I, this isn't what I expected of my life. I expected that I would be spending the, you know, many years caring for a very sick person who would just fade away eventually, you know, and, and have long-term problems and that I would be a caregiver. And I've, I've built my life around that. And, um, you know, these have been happy tears for families, but I, I do think that it has had a very profound impact on parents, at least the parents that I have worked with, um, and to allow them the space to really talk about this. And one of the mothers in particular, you know, that was, conversation was a number of months ago, and she said really had a happy turn in her life. She reestablished um, a relationship that she thought was over. Um, she's going to get married next month, uh, remarried. And so, you know, people are able to find their way, but I think that grief is, is real for them. It's not the life they expected. And so anyway, I'll go back and let you ask some other of the questions. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, another dietary question. Um, how are you managing the adults with CF when they're resistant to letting go of their legacy diet, which is high fat and high calorie that they've enjoyed all their life to a more healthy, normal diet? You know, essentially it comes, it's their decision. They're the one who chooses what goes in their mouth. That That's it. And so, you know, we can, we can talk through them and talk about what are their goals? What do they want to accomplish? Um, do they have, uh, you know, health and fitness goals? You know, we really try to present, and I, I say we, speaking for the dietitian nutritionist group, you know, I think all of us really try to um, promote, you know, some uh, self-determination. What do people really want to do? Um, and if they've enjoyed it, you know, are there ways they can still enjoy, um, you know, a normal, healthy, balanced diet that includes those kind of sometime foods? Um, they make the decision and, you know, we merely provide some guidance when they ask for it. So, um, and then I don't work with adults, but, uh, you know, it, we all make our own decisions about food. And so we can provide a roadmap, but it's up to them to get on the road and to do it. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Um, Dr. Brown, a question coming in for you. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we might approach stratifying CF care differently based on individuals that are having long periods of stability and reduced exacerbation risk on ETI? I think, you know, and I can say my own clinical experience is, is, is that the benefits of ETI have been across the spectrum of baseline severe, disease severity. So P, that by saying that, we've seen people whose lung function was at the transplant level um, achieve sustained benefit and prolonged periods outside of the hospital, um, kind of going back to you know, what Sigurd was talking about in the baby boom, right before, before Trikafta, uh, we just had a, we had a patient who was about to be listed for transplant with lung function less than 20%. She delivered her first child last week and through an entire pregnancy, she was not in the hospital, not one time. Uh, and her lung function stayed stable. It wasn't great. I, I'll tell you, I was biting my fingernails the whole time but she achieved her dream of becoming a mother. Um, so I think it's hard to stratify because we are really seeing benefits across the spectrum of baseline lung function and disease. So to say that we, you know, what I could, what I, I, I do need, need to, um, or what we need to think about as a CF community is the care model, what is our care model of the future going to look like? We've had to introduce by the nature of the pandemic, telehealth. We are going to have people who are more active, more engaged in their lives and coming to clinic four times a year, especially in some of us, you know, as you know, CF care stretches across the state. So when you're asking individuals to take a day off work, travel, pay for the gas, pay for parking, it may not look the same. So when we have people who have prolonged periods of stability, they're not coming, they're not coming into the hospital, their lung function is stable. Um, we may need to think more carefully about what does their care look like? Because what, I mean, our goal as a community is for people to live the lives they want, free of disease and in good health. And if people are, you know, having to come in four times a year, that may not be um, the right choice for every patient. So I think what, what I've started to do is I've, you know, at this point for patients who do live far from the center, I alternate in person and virtual visits. As you know, many of our patients have home spirometers that can supplement their care, but that provides these individuals with the ability um, to, 
you know, maintain their jobs and, uh, you know, not be able to be so tightly beholden. And what I've said kind of all along is, you know, for so many of our patients that work in jobs that earn an hourly wage, when they have, when they come to clinic, they're not just paying for gas and paying for parking. We're taking real money out of their pocket. That is, that is eight hours that they can't work. So it's not just the cost of coming to clinic, it's actual real money. And when we, we're talking about things like food insecurity, um, we need to factor that into the future care. So I think, again, it kind of comes back to the conversation that you have with your patient and the trust you have with your patient about what's sustainable for them, particularly when they're stable. Um, one other question. Dr. Brown, can you speak to any conversations you've had with eligible patients who decline to start modulator therapy? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so for some individuals who, ha who have perceived stability, um, we had some individuals choose not to start modulators. And I think the ones that come to mind are people who tended to have milder mutations, less severe disease. So people who had residual function mutations to begin with. Those individuals often will say, look, I don't get sick and I'm, I'm many of them whom are pancreatic sufficient. And so they said, you know, I appreciate that this is um, something that I might choose in the future, but for right now, this isn't something I want to do. That being said, some of those patients, now that they're seeing the two years, people in social media feeds, the popular press, the uh, CF Foundation sites, two years in, you know, we recently had one of the individuals who chose not to start make that make an different decision here within the past month. Um, another is an individual who is a young woman who is in her early 20s, late teens, early 20s, who she she's still on our canby. She's like, look, I achieved clinical stability on our can canby and my lung function is 100%. Why should I change? And we've had these conversations, including conversations around birth control, right? Because they can't be on birth control in her family, but she hasn't wanted to make that change. And I have a, a hard time convincing people to do that when they're, when they're clinically stable, once we've had sort of the um, uh, pros and cons discussion wise. And, and then the, the flip side are the people who start and then stop. And I think mental health has been one of the reasons that we've seen people make choices to stop, worsening depression, anxiety, and the perception that, that their anxiety or depression has been much worse since being on a highly effective modulator. And to me, that says we, there's a lot more we need to learn about what CFTR does in the brain. Mm -hmm. Can I just add also, please, um, to Dr. Brown's um, response, you know, uh, in, in, my area of women's health and reproductive health, we see uh, some women decline um, the initiation of these um, HEMTs because they want to get pregnant and they are not sure about the safety of these meds um, while pregnant, while um, maybe breastfeeding if they were successful. So th they choose not to start uh, these modulators um, until after they've completely stopped breastfeeding because they're still not convinced that the the safety of these meds warrant initiation. So I just wanted to add that as a group of, of patients who are hesitating with starting modulators. Well, I think we have exhausted our questions. Um, I would just like to end, there is a comment in the chat box uh, from Geraldo. Uh, just a comment. I moved from Brazil to the U.S. to access Trikafta. I am 39 years old and have advanced lung disease. Even with this background, I have seen a huge improvement in my health overall. It was a long, long journey to the U.S., but I could do the same journey again to have this chance. I think that's a good ending. And that is a good ending. And I just would like to say that as we're talking and uh, 
like appreciating all these benefits, it's important that we not forget about our colleagues that may not have access to this for their patients and the people with CF around the world who don't yes. have access. Yes. Thank you to all of our speakers. Great point. And with that, I think we will end our session. Thank you, Mayor.